Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, please feel free to use the chat box or the comment section to introduce yourself and your organization as we wait for um, our other attendees to come and for us to get started. I'm really excited to have you here and to have a meaningful discussion with our panelists and audience today. Um, if you're joining us on Zoom and you're experiencing any issues, please check your Zoom settings and your internet connection. Um, you can also visit any of our partners' pages for the Facebook Live broadcast in, in case you get disconnected. And if you have issues, please feel free also to use the chat box so that um, one of our team members can assist you. Um, this event is hosted by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, the Ateneo School of Government, through the Ateneo Policy Center, and ID Insight. The program will begin in a few minutes. Um, in the meantime, please check out some videos from our partners. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals. Um, do research and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! The Philippines deserves a government that champions justice, sustainability, economic inclusivity, and democracy where every child can study and be given the opportunity to fulfill their dreams, where every sick worker can rest easy knowing quality health care is within reach, where every farmer can toil, see assets and productivity grow, and reap the benefits of hard work, where every community can flourish in harmony with its environment and with other communities. All these continue to be ideals to strive for, to work for, but true hope and authentic change are within sight. And this can pave the way for a better government, one closer to what the Filipino truly deserves. A new breed of leaders is on the horizon. Leaders who are unafraid to meet people from all walks of life, to listen, to collaborate, to work together. Leaders equipped with technical proficiency who study and learn and make difficult governance choices based on evidence. Leaders who are able to discern right from wrong, who choose to do more and better. Leaders with the passion, dedication, and commitment to serve the Filipino nation. And you can be that leader too. The Ateneo School of Government cultivates Filipino leaders to become professional public servant leaders who can help build the nation through good governance. The Master in Public Management program is designed to develop leadership competencies by building technical proficiency, political acumen, and all anchored by the principles of ethical and good governance. It emphasizes theory and practice, guided by cutting-edge research, ensuring relevance, groundedness, and application in solving real-world issues. The core courses develop new perspective and innovative approaches on leadership, ethics, economics, public policy, and public governance. The elective courses further enhance skills in formulating frameworks and strategies, providing an intensive and interdisciplinary course of study for public managers and servant leaders. The program also offers specialized tracks to address target areas of concern which the partner agency or local government unit is experiencing. Local Governance Track 
harness the power of decentralized government to ensure local development. Health Governance Track Build efficient and equitable healthcare systems that promote better outcomes. Climate Change and Environmental Governance Track Understand present risks to engineer sustainable development in the future. Technology-Based Enterprise Development Track Support scientific and technological innovation to promote inclusive development. Rural and Agricultural Development Track Find solutions to chronic problems of low productivity and unfair market practices. Energy Transition Track Widen energy access, improve energy efficiency, and move to renewable energy to empower lives and communities. National Security Track Understand the complex external and domestic security challenges and learn to manage resources employed by the state to protect our lives, properties, and above all, our democratic way of life. Our core faculty and professors of praxis are multidisciplinary experts, well-respected practitioners, dedicated to cultivating a new generation of leaders who can leave a positive impact on Filipino lives. The Ateneo School of Government Master in Public Management program is committed to the mission of nation building by contributing to the formation of excellent and ethical public servants who can elevate the standards of governance in the Philippines. Our students and our graduates share in this mission. And you can too. Enroll in the Master in Public Management program. And be a part of the government that our country truly deserves. Lead with mind. Serve with heart. The Ateneo School of Government Forming leaders, leading reforms. In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRP widget under the Databases tab or type SIRP-P.PIDS.gov.PA. SIRP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. All at the same time! SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Maximizing Social Impact, the Power of Data in Public Policy. We're very excited to see a lot of participants joining us today on Zoom and on Facebook Live. This roundtable is brought to you by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Ateneo School of Government through the Ateneo Policy Center, and ID Insight. My name is Aya Silva. I'll be your host and moderator for today's event. I'm a director at the Southeast Asia office of ID Insight. Um, ID Insight is a mission-driven global advisory data analytics and research organization that helps global development leaders maximize their social impact. Uh, we tailor a wide range of data and evidence tools to help decision makers design effective programs and rigor rigorously test what works to support communities. We'll hear a little bit more about ID Insight later on. Um, so to kick us off, you know, data is a powerful tool to drive effective policymaking and improve public services. Governments need high quality and timely data to shape and implement better policies to ultimately improve people's lives. It can be used in many ways to understand people's needs, to know whom to deliver services to and how, and to measure outcomes of programs. But despite the clear benefits of using data, it doesn't always happen. Um, having data is a first step, but that isn't always easy. Gathering data requires resources and expertise. And even when you already have data, it doesn't automatically translate into data use. So in this roundtable discussion, we'll try to better understand the barriers and enablers to data use. Today, we'll hear from the data and evidence community on their initiatives to promote evidence use by generating high quality and representative data. We'll also talk about fostering a culture of data use where we need collective action of many actors in the broader development community. There really is a lot of room for many different roles. So we'll see and discuss how our work can complement each other. So over the next two hours, we'll hear from various perspectives. Um, if you can move to the, our program. Uh, yeah. So Dr. Randy Tuanya will kick us off with opening remarks. We'll then be hearing two presentations. The first one is from Dr. Celia Reyes on the community-based monitoring system. And the second one is from Sarah Lucas about the data on demand initiative of ID Insight. We will then hear from two reactors, Dr. Imelda Dainla from Bosses Filipinas and Dr. Robin Garcia of WR Numero Research. Then we'll spend about 30 to 40 minutes in a panel discussion with Bernadette Mandap of CBMS and then with Sarah Ime and Robin. Um, we'll invite our audience to share their questions um, and comments in the panel discussion. Um, so we'll wrap up before 5 p.m. with a few words from Dr. Aniceto Orbeta. To start us off, then let's welcome Dr. Randy Tuanyo to give the opening remarks. Dr. Tuanya is the Dean of the Ateneo School of Government. Over to you, Dr. Randy. Dean Randy. Thank you. Thank you. Aya. A pleasant good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of ID Insight, the Ateneo School of Government, our ASOG, and the Ateneo Policy Center, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, I am pleased to welcome our distinguished speakers and discussant. Ms. Sara Lucas, the Global Data on Command Lead of ID Insight, Dr. Celia Reyes, former president of the PIDS and network leader, community-based monitoring system, Ms. Badet Mandap, research and administrative officer of CBMS. Both Dr. Celia and uh, Badet are longtime friends in our shared work of undertaking better poverty monitoring work in local communities in the country. Dr. Imelda Dainla, ASOG Associate Professor and Convener of Bosses, Filipinas, and Dr. Robin Garcia, CEO of WR Numero Research. Faculty and research colleagues, students, and friends, welcome to this webinar. We'd also like to recognize the presence of Dr. Aniceto Babes Urbeta, the President of the PADS, and our former ASOG Dean, Don, uh, Dr. Ronald Don Mendoza, who is now the Regional Director of the uh, Southeast Asia program of ID Insight, who have been kind enough to grace us with several words. This event would not have been possible without the unending support and joint commitment of our partners from ID Insight and the PIDS. PIDS. This webinar, we know, is organized at, at a time when the abundance of data is unprecedented. 
given the proliferation of the internet, social media, smartphones, and other types of technologies, data has become versatile and present everywhere, allowing for a preponderance of information. All this data aims to provide valuable insights and opportunities for different societal stakeholders to make informed decisions and also to drive innovation for new policies and products. However, the continuous challenge would be on what should be done with all this information and how can we better and more efficiently utilize this information so that they can improve the quality of policies and programs and better the lives of our own citizens, especially the marginalized sectors of society. As we'll be discussing in today's session, governments and social sector organizations around the world have the potential to increase their social and development impact by using data more frequently and by using high quality and timely data for decision making. ID Insight, the Ateneo School of Government through the Ateneo Policy Center and the Philippine Institute for Development Studies have joined to bring, to bring development practitioners and academics engaged in evidence-based policy making to discuss experiences and innovations to foster data use to maximize their impact on people's lives. Today, we are engaging experts and thought leaders on their experiences and best practices for leveraging data to inform policy decisions and improve programs. While we know that data is neutral in the sense that it is just a collection of raw facts and figures, the way that data is collected, analyzed, and interpreted can be subject to biases and errors and can lead to misleading conclusions. Thus, it is a product of complex social processes. It is a product of decisions made throughout processes of collecting, processing, and analyzing phenomena, the way information is visualized, and where and how information can be accessed. We know that data information is integral in ensuring that policies and programs have a positive impact in implementing public policy programs for the common good. Components of data collection and identification are essential in delivering aid both for humanitarian institutions and recipients of aid. We need more nuanced research that recognizes and unravels the complex motivations and practices of aid entities, as well as the varieties of experience and perspectives that aid subjects have with data, according to the scope. How data is used in bringing more of this nuanced research to make positive impacts, likewise questions whether data can be truly neutral. We beg to ask for whom, why, and when is data used. And thus, this should push us to critically consider how data is collected, processed, and utilized. Therefore, it is very important to consider also the quality and reliability of data and the methods used to analyze it. This event will feature two innovative initiatives in generating data to support evidence-based policymaking. First, the data on demand, which delivers high-quality representative survey data to social sector leaders to a careful consideration of people's needs, preferences, living conditions, behaviors, in contributing to the implementation of high-impact policies and programs, and the community-based monitoring system, which is an organized system of collecting, processing, and validating necessary disaggregated data that can be technology-based and which have been used by many local government units in the country and also around the world for planning, program implementation, and impact monitoring at the local level while empowering communities to participate in the process. We recognize that data alone is not sufficient to make good policy decisions in the end. Data must be complemented by sound judgment, expertise, and the understanding of the social, economic, and political context in which policies can be developed and implemented. Policymakers must also consider ethical considerations, such as the potential impact of policies, especially in marginalized groups, and the need to ensure the privacy and security of data. We are grateful that in this session, this afternoon, we have several resource persons who will deepen our understanding of the growing implications of data in contemporary society and its recognized and indispensable value in policymaking. Once again, thank you for coming today, and we look forward to a fruitful discussion with everyone. Rhyming Salamat. Thank you very much, Dean Randy. Um, with that, let's get started with the presentations. Um, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Celia Reyes. 
Dr. Reyes was the first woman president of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and an expert in the field of econometrics. She has published numerous research and policy papers on poverty assessments and evaluations of social protection programs. With her vast experience in poverty reduction and economics, she'll be discussing the CBMS, the Community-Based Monitoring System, and its potential to drive effective policymaking and improve public services. Dr. Reyes developed CBMS, a local poverty monitoring tool that has provided free technical assistance to local government units in the Philippines. CBMS is an organized technology-based system of collecting, processing, and validating necessary disaggregated data that may be used for planning, program implementation, and impact monitoring at the local level, while also empowering communities to participate in that process. Dr. Reyes is unable to join us live today, but has sent a recorded presentation, which we'll play shortly. Good morning to everyone. I'd like to thank PIDS President uh, Aniceto Orbeta, Ateneo School of Government Dean Randy Tuanyo, ID Insight Southeast Asia Regional Director Ron Mendoza for inviting me today to share um, the work that I've been engaged in for the last three decades, uh, the community-based monitoring system. I would like to um, talk about three um, aspects of CBMS, um, how CBMS came to be, um, use of CBMS for decision-making and policy-making at the local level, and institu institutionalization of CBMS. First, let me talk about how CBMS uh, came to be, and I'll provide a brief background. Um, in, the, in 1991, um, the PIDS embarked on a project called Micro Impacts of Macroeconomic and Adjustment Policies, or MIMA project, which was supported by IDRC. And the aim of the project was really to be able to track uh, the impacts of all of these uh, macro and adjustment policies, like stabilization policies, liberalization policies, and the like, on vulnerable sectors of the um, population. Um, but what came out of the initial um, assessment was that there was lack of data to monitor impacts of macro policies at the local level. Um, so this was one of the major findings at the early stages of MIMAP. Um, also at around that time, RA7160 or the local government code was passed in 1991, devolving many functions to the local governments. This increased the demand for more disaggregated data to support local level planning and budgeting. So we came up with um, the CBMS um, design. Um, earlier um, assessment by MIMAP showed that uh, there's really a lack of data. And so we came up with a design um, that would lodge a local monitoring system at the LGU with the participation of the community. Um, we pilot tested this in Pandi Bulacan in 1995. Um, there was first uh, um, province-wide implementation in Palawan in 2000. And by 2019, uh, we had 111 cities, 1,091 municipalities, and over 30,000 barangays in 78 provinces in the country implementing CBMS. This was also implemented in, the lo in local context and selected sites in 29 countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So why is CBMS important? Actually, um, as in the case with many other countries, there's very little information at the local levels. So data coming from National Statistics offices are um, provide data at the national, um, at best at the provincial level, um, but very little information at the municipal and barangay uh, levels. So um, what CBMS um, aims to do is to fill in the gap by providing more information at the local level. So CBMS um, actually tries to provide, uh, to respond to the following concerns, the lack of necessary disaggregated data, 
for diagnosing the extent of poverty at the local level, for determining the causes of poverty, for formulating appropriate policies and programs, for identifying eligible beneficiaries, so targeting was already a concern even at that time, and assessing impact of policies and programs. Moreover, there was a need for support mechanisms for the implementation of the decentralization policy. So what are the key features of CBMS? One is that it involves a census of all households in the community. As some might say, why not just uh, you know, sample a few households in the community? CBMS was designed uh, to be a census so that this could be easily implemented by local government units. So might not be familiar with um, you know, uh, sampling techniques and um, 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 all the statistical capacities that you need to be able to do um, sample surveys. Um, another key feature is that uh, it's local government unit based while promoting community participation. This is very important because we've assessed many local monitoring systems, mainly done by NGOs, and we noted that um, this was actually the monitoring systems that they've implemented are coterminous with the projects. Um, and so the issue of sustainability um, is, is critical. Um, nevertheless, we also in, um, uh, recognize that having the communities participate in the monitoring system is actually very, is very important. Um, it taps existing LGU personnel and community members as monitors. This is a strategy to keep the cost of the monitoring system um, low. Um, it also generates a core set of indicators that are being measured to determine the welfare status of the population. These indicators capture the multidimensional aspects of poverty. So even at that time, um, we recognize that income is not adequate to be able to um, assess the poverty status of the um, um, population. Uh, moreover, it uses freeware customized for CBMS data collection, processing, and poverty mapping. Um, we've realized that um, for the system to be appealing to local government units, um, one, there should be customized uh, system. And uh, more importantly, they should be free because not all of the local government units can afford uh, commercial softwares. Um, another key feature is that it establishes database at each geopolitical level. The aim really is for the data to be used even at the barangay level. So it's not um, data being collected at the local level to be aggregated and used at the national level, but for data to be used at each geopolitical level. Um, what have been the enhancements of the CDMS uh, tools since then? Um, as I mentioned earlier, we started um, implementing, piloting and implementing it um, in 1995. Um, so um, in terms of data collection from paper and pen to the use of tablets and online submission of data, um, in terms of data processing from manual computation to Excel-based processing to a customized processing system that we have developed called uh, StatSim. And then from mapping from barangay spot maps to maps using GPS at the household level. So uh, we've made use of advances in technology um, to be able to enhance the CBMS tool. Um, moreover, the use of CBMS has expanded from local poverty monitoring to monitoring thematic concerns and local governance. So it has been used for disaster preparedness and the monitoring MDGs and SDGs, um, uh, monitoring child labor, uh, gender responsive budgeting, and other concerns. So how is CBMS different from other monitoring systems? I think the main uh, most important difference is that it is LGU based. Um, as I mentioned, that was really designed to ensure sustainability of the system. And also that was at the time that was really, uh, there was really a demand from local governments um, for more data to help them uh, come up with informed decisions. Um, there's also a customized processing system that we have developed and um, and this was actually, this became very appealing to local government units, so they don't have to worry about how do you compute, compute um, correctly uh, employment rate, how do you compute school participation rate, and so forth. 
um, it was designed for implementation and use at the local level. So it's a census, as I mentioned, because of the difficulty of coming up with a good sampling design, um, taking into account non response and so forth. Um, it's relatively, uh, it relatively uses a short questionnaire, um, this participation of LG personnel and communities and so forth. Um, also, the indicator system is based on multidimensionality of poverty and it's able to capture simultaneous deprivations. Um, also, um, it, the system um, allows for household and individual level mapping. So we can locate households who don't have access to um, water, um, individuals or children who are not going to school. Uh, because of the GIS component of the system. So let me turn now to the use of CBMS in decision making at the local level. Um, so why is it CBMS important? As I mentioned earlier, it responds to lack of necessary disaggregated data and um, supports um, uh, the implementation of the decentralization policy. Um, it facilitates greater transparency and accountability in local governance because um, it shows, um, you know, that if, if certain resources were used to address a particular issue, um, the regular conduct of CBMS would show whether in, there's impact in terms of um, um, how resources were used. So you can track over time whether the water supply problem has been addressed, uh, whether um, children, more children are attending school because of um, new um, school facility. Um, and so because of this um, um, availability of, of information, um, it actually facilitates greater transparency and accountability in local governance. So um, CBMS actually generates the necessary local level data and with all the necessary disaggregation for evidence-based decision making. Because it's based on the census of households in the community, you can actually generate household and individual data. And you know it's disaggregated by age, sex, sublocation, income class, and other socioeconomic and demographic characteristics. You can also generate data um, for specific vulnerable groups, such as children, youth, women, elderly, persons with disabilities, and indigenous peoples, among others. And more recently, we've been using CBMS to track SDG at the local level. Um, so you can actually see who are actually being left behind um, with the use of CBMS. So uses of CBMS um, by the local governments, um, they mainly use it for preparation of local development profiles and plans, for the design, targeting, and implementation of programs and interventions, uh, for policy analysis and impact assessment in the context of various thematic concerns. Um, let me provide you a, a few examples. So in the case of Palawan, um, it was the first province to adopt CBMS with the issuance of Provincial Executive Order Number 15 in November 1999, and it produced its first Provincial Human Development Report with the data generated from CBMS. Um, the provincial government has maintained its CBMS database from its conduct of eight rounds of CBMS census since 2000, with last updating done in 2018. So actually, we've attended um, their um, planning um, workshops, and they were able to um, show, uh, to use the information um, to prioritize um, programs being implemented by the province, and um, more importantly, um, to assist municipalities in prioritizing their programs. Um, they were comparing their situation with their neighboring municipalities, and so it was sort of like a, a competition for them um, trying to um, outperform um, the other um, municipalities. In the case of Carmona, um, it implemented CBMS since 2008 and has built its database with at least four rounds of completed CBMS census. Um, and the CBMS enhanced Carmona's ecological profiling and mapping of vulnerable groups and critical facilities. Um, more recently, the LGU CBMS database um, provided basis for distribution of COVID-19 pandemic-related uh, programs. Um, 
Carmona has also used the benefit extensively in its um, in the delivery of programs for persons with disabilities, and um, I think they have um, developed new programs uh, uh, specifically for this particular vulnerable group. Uh, in the case of Tobacco City, um, it has established its CBMS database with six completed CBMS census rounds since 2008 and it actually enabled them to track the impact of safe water projects supported by development partners. They noted in one of their CBMS rounds that um, there was low access to safe water in one of the uh, barangays, and they used the CBMS data to um, submit a proposal to one of the international development partner, and I think the uh, development partner appreciated that they can actually um, locate the households who don't have access to water and um, tobacco was also able to show what happened after the intervention um, i think you can see in the, in the slide there um, that uh, those um, households uh, um, got access to safe water because of the the intervention um, so cbms has improved the lgu's program monitoring and evaluation by providing clear benchmarks and measurable outputs and outcomes um, but i think uh, so far i've talked about how um, local government units have used uh, cbms um, to help them in their um, local planning and, and budgeting and also monitoring the impacts of their interventions but I think uh, more importantly, CBMS has also empowered communities to demand for the services that they need. Um, so when given the information, um, they realize that there are some services that they need that were not being provided, um, and some services that were be being given that were not their top priority. So um, in, in that sense, CBMS um, empowered the communities to demand for the services that they need the most. So let me turn now to the institutionalization of CBMS. Um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, we, the CBMS network, have been engaged in the development of CBMS tools. Um, and what has happened is that after the pilot testing, it has become um, demand-driven. So LGUs who are interested in implementing CBMS um, would um, approach us and they would they bore me with the, the cost of implementation with um, just technical assistance from um, the CBMS network and also capacity building support from the ILG. Um, there was also regular conduct of training of CBMS trainers from the ILG and, uh, and the academy by um, the CBMS network. Um, there was also um, collaboration with other development partners to scale up implementation of use uh, and use of CBMS. Um, and um, in terms of best practices and strategies and implementation and uses, these were shared and presented in the annual CBMS national conferences by the LGUs themselves. So um, we can see from here that um, it was mainly um, uh, the LGUs um, who um, demanded for um, the system to be established in their own localities and they um, bore the cost of um, uh, the, the, the system the implementation of the system and so what we um, re realize is that if LGUs find it useful they will um, actually invest in the system so that by 2019 as I've mentioned earlier um, more than half of the, the uh, municipalities and cities have actually implemented um, CBMS. After all of those years, um, uh, there was the uh, bill was uh, introduced during the 17th Congress at the House of Representatives by um, Congressman um, Garcia from Bataan. And um, it was passed into law on April 17, the following year. So they were saying that this is actually um, quite fast. Uh, quite uh, fast. So um, you know, from from the date of filing to um, enactment, um, I think primarily also because um, many of those who were um, in the House of Representatives and also at the Senate were 
previous uh, local chief executives who were implementing CBMS, so they were quite familiar with uh, CBMS and how um, CBMS has actually helped them. Um, and so it, the RA11315 was actually enacted in, in 2019. And some of the major provisions are um, CBMS should be established in every city and municipality for the formulation and implementation of poverty reduction and development poverty reducing development programs. Um, uh, CBMS data should be used by national government agencies in prioritizing timely, relevant, and much needed social protection programs by government in areas with highest in incidence of poverty. Each city and municipality is the primary data um, um, collecting authority, and um, PSA shall be the lead agency in the implementation of CBMS. And um, the aggregated data will be stored by PSA to create a national CBMS data bank. Um, also, fourth and fifth, fourth, fifth, and sixth class municipalities should be given priority financial assistance in the first three years of implementation. And the other cities and municipalities will be assisted thereafter to ensure full implementation of the law. Since enactment, where are we right now in terms of implementation? Uh, the implemented rules and regulation were actually completed um, in 2019. Um, the CBMS Council, led by PSA, DILG, and DICT, um, has been formed. Um, technical working groups uh, to support the CBMS Council were also created. The data collection instrument has been updated. PSA has provided capacity building and 638 LGUs have collected data and um, clean data um, for PSA funded areas numbering about 323 LGUs will be available in the third quarter of 2023. So um, what are the challenges in the institutionalization of CBMS? So I think um, for me, the, the most or the primary challenge would be sustaining the interest of LGUs to fund and use CBMS regularly. Um, as I mentioned in the past, the LGUs have been actually funding the conduct of CBMS using their own resources. Um, but with the law, um, there will be some support um, initially for um, uh, the poorer municipalities, but that's still a lot of resources. So I, I really think that the LGU should be encouraged um, to um, fund um, their, their CBMS uh, so they could conduct it regularly. Um, also, there's need for continuing capacity building of LGUs, particularly um, in statistical activities and local planning and budgeting so that they can um, maximize the use of um, uh, CBMS data. And finally, I think keeping the system up to date with emerging concerns. Um, so there's a research component to CBMS. So how do you um, enhance or, or update the, the questionnaire? How do you make sure that um, you're collecting the information that's needed for um, to address emerging concerns? So, but I, I think um, it has been a long journey, but um, I'm very glad that the CBMS has been uh, institutionalized to assist local government units um, for um, local planning and budgeting, and uh, more importantly, has provided um, the tool for the communities to um, also demand um, um, services from um, their um, uh, local governments. Thank you. Thank you very much to Dr. Reyes for sharing that with us. Um, it's really good to see how CBMS has come such a long way in its three decades to empower communities and to demand for the services that they need. Um, I can already see some interesting questions coming in through the chat box on CBMS with new indicators, um, improvements on the CBMS app, and um, availability of the data set. Please feel free to send more in. We'll try to answer as much as we can during the panel discussion later. Um, for now, I'd like to turn to our next presenter, Sarah Lucas, who is the Global Data On Demand Lead for ID Insight. Sarah leads the Global Data On Demand Initiative, or DOD, 
team um, working to expand the scope and impact of that initiative. She is based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, previously, she worked at the William and Flora Ulet Foundation and the Millennium Challenge Corporation, where she focused on data-informed policymaking. I work with Sarah at ID Insight um, as we are expanding data on demand operations to the Philippines. Um, data on demand delivers high quality representative survey data to social sector leaders in time for decisions that they need to make. The approach includes having local surveyors, having sampling innovations, and custom built software called Survey Stream to process large amounts of data quickly, and also having a robust data quality system. So, DoD really aims to produce decision relevant insights within days or weeks rather than months. Sarah will be talking about lessons we've learned at fostering public sector use of data and evidence-based um, decision-making based on our experiences in DOD. Please join me in welcoming Sarah. Thank you, Aya. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to meet all of you virtually. Uh, as I dive in on data on demand, I wanted to start by introducing you to a few key people that are part of the team. So as Aya mentioned, I'm Sarah Lucas. I'm the global lead for data on demand. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. But the folks that are more in your midst are Ron Mendoza. He is ID Insights Regional Director for Southeast Asia. Aya, who you've already met, is our Director for Data on Demand in the Philippines. And Mika is a manager on the Data on Demand team in the Philippines. So while my job is to bring in the experiences and perspectives from our global DOD work, which was born in India and is now expanding to Southeast Asia and Africa, Ron and Aya and Mika's jobs are to ground all of that global experience in a Philippines implementation of DOD. So as Aya mentioned, I've worked in the data and evidence to policy space for many years. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's that while many countries are awash in good research and data, only a portion of that is ultimately used for public sector decision making. And there's two sides to that problem, right? So public sector agencies on the one hand might not have sufficiently strong cultures of data and evidence use or the capacities or the resources for it. And on the other hand, we data producers sometimes are not great at making our data and research sufficiently useful and usable for people. And so our goal at Data on Demand is that public sector partners use data to improve policy and program decisions and improve outcomes for people. So today I'm gonna to share three lessons about fostering public sector use of data and how these lessons are shaping and uh, being manifest in Data on Demand. So there's three lessons I'm gonna to touch on today. The first is, is the most basic, which is make data relevant and reliable for decision making. This is, I think, as we all know, a necessary but not sufficient condition. The second lesson is to take data to the decisions. This refers to tailoring data to the routine decisions that public sector agencies are making already. The third lesson is to institutionalize data use. I was so pleased to see Dr. Reyes talking about uh, the institutionalization of CBMS. Um, that's really about supporting agencies' capacity and systems to generate and use good data in an ongoing, sustained way. So I'm going to walk through each of these with examples from DOD. So the first and most foundational aspect of fostering data use, of course, is producing data that is relevant and reliable for decision making. So let's start there. And in this section, I'm going to focus on three elements that make data relevant and reliable for decision making. Data quality, timeliness, and representation. And I'm going to talk about how we're building each of these into data on demand, which I'll refer to as DOD. So there are three pillars of DOD. I already previewed this. Each of these pillars has a really important role to play in making data high quality, timely, and representative. So the first is SurveyStream. This is our custom built survey management software. It's built on top of SurveyCTO and it streamlines a lot of aspects of survey operation. So this allows us to both reduce time that it takes to collect data and then survey streams built in data quality features help us enhance data quality. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a minute. The second core pillar is field networks. 
we train and manage for quality. And we, we, in many cases, have standing enumerator networks and supervisory networks. So it makes it possible to launch a data collection effort more quickly. So again, contributing to timeliness. And the third is around sampling. Our team is finding innovative approaches to sampling that ensure quality and representation while trying to also be lower cost and faster than traditional household listing methods. So we're applying all three of these pillars in the Philippines uh, in a nationally representative survey that the team is doing with the Department of Health, which I'll describe in a minute. But just to, uh, to draw your attention to this map, this map shows the extent of our planned survey operations here in the Philippines. This map shows 200 clusters, each is designated with a pin, spread out across 81 provinces and 17 regions in the Philippines. And our target is to survey households in each of those clusters. So I just wanna pause for a minute and acknowledge how hard it is to maintain data quality at scale. At DOD, we're operating at large scale, as you've seen from the previous slide. In one of our, in a single state in India, we are conducting a multi-sector survey across 60,000 households. As we just heard from Dr. Reyes, CVMS is operating at a massive scale. So it's quite hard actually to be uh, good at data quality at that kind of scale and you have to be really careful about it. So I'll talk a bit about how we're doing that uh, in DOD. So this slide shows how attention to data quality starts even before a survey begins with careful hiring and training of enumerators in our field networks. And then during a survey, SurveyStream, our custom built uh, software, survey management software, enables high frequency data quality checks. And these are tracked by managers, survey managers through dashboards, and they're conveyed back to enumerators through reports and through direct feedback from field supervisors. And then we also build in standard quality checks like back checks and audio audits and things of that nature. Those real-time high-frequency data quality checks that SurveyStream enables helps us see data quality issues early. It catches things like logical inconsistencies of responses and outliers. It detects things like high non-response rates or refusal rates. And this makes it possible to be more targeted in real time and how we do back checks and other kinds of checks and importantly, to immediately engage with field networks so they can address the quality issues before exacerbating them through further data collection. So that was a quick look at the first two pillars, the field network and survey stream. The third is around sampling. And as Dr. Reyes mentioned, sampling can actually be quite complicated. So I'm gonna quickly go through three sampling approaches that our team in India is developing. Each is designed to make sampling faster and less costly than standard household listings while upholding quality and representation. So the first is an innovation coming out of India, which is around using voter rolls as a sampling frame. This is a technique that is uniquely suited to India because in India, unlike most other countries, being on a voter roll is mandatory. So the exclusion risks are quite low, unlike in countries where you have to opt in to a voter roll. So there's a lot of information on this slide. You're gonna see reference to something called a mandal, which is a small administrative unit below a state or a district level in India. But the main message here is at the bottom of the slide, the yellow portion. The team uses two-stage sampling, first randomly selecting among polling stations in a district, and then randomly selecting households within the selected polling stations. And those data are of course all available through the voter rolls. And this approach has proved very accurate and quite fast and inexpensive in rural areas in India, though I will admit that it's less reliable uh, in urban areas. So now let me turn to a second grid, a uh, second sampling approach, which we are using in urban areas in India and actually across the country in the Philippines, which is called grid-based sampling. So this slide shows both kind of a, through real photos and a stylized illustration of the same concept. You start with the geographic area, it shows here as an urban agglomeration because that's what we're using in India, but in fact, in the Philippines, as I mentioned, we're using this across the country. So you start by um, identifying an area and a geographic area, and then you divide that area into grids using geospatial data. Then you randomly select the grids, do a household listing in that grid, 
and then randomly select households within the grid. So the goal is to be faster than traditional full household listings. Though as with any innovation, there is a learning curve. So it's not super speedy yet, but in the future we expect it to really be cost and time savings while maintaining quality. And of course, faster sampling leads to more timely data, which increases the chances that data will be used for decision-making. So the third approach to sampling is dual frame sampling. And this is a particularly important technique if you wanna get a closer look at certain subpopulations. So in the case illustrated here in this slide, the team in India used voter roles as the primary frame, but the government partner we were working with was particularly understanding, interested in understanding the experiences of pregnant and lactating women in the so-called KCR kit scheme. This is a scheme at the state level which provides pregnant women with basic supplies and encourages them to give birth in hospitals. And they wanted to understand who was enrolling and what the, what the outcomes were from this program. And they really needed a close look at pregnant and lactating women. So that's why this sampling frame was used. But it could be used, this dual frame sampling can be used really to get a close look at any subpopulation that you're interested in. Okay, that was a lot, but that was a look at the first lesson, make data relevant and reliable for decision-making, specifically by making data high quality, timely, and representative. The second lesson is take the data to the decisions. Uh, what that means here is take target the decisions that governments make on a routine basis, allocating budgets, designing or targeting programs, reporting to legislatures. You infiltrate the decisions that they're already making with data, and that can really increase the chances that the data will be used. This, of course, requires working closely with public sector partners to understand what their decisions are and what data are needed to make them. And I'm going to share three quick examples of that. The first example is here in the Philippines. Our DOD team is working with the Department of Health on their National Health Promotion and Literacy Survey. DOD is going to be capturing data on health-related knowledge, attitudes, and practices of Filipinos. But we've talked explicitly with DOH about how they're going to use these data. They're going to use them to design national public health campaigns and behavior change initiatives, allocate resources, and get feedback from communities about their programs. So this is a great example of when we know how the data will be used, we can collect specific actionable information. For example, it's not enough for DOH to know whether people are practicing healthy behavior or not. They need to know why if they actually wanna change those behaviors. So for example, are the health promotion leaflets that they're producing easier or hard to understand? Maybe people understand those leaflets and the information in them, but they don't wanna seek medical care. Or maybe they wanna seek healthcare and they're finding it to be inaccessible. You have to be able to unpack all of that to make data actionable for decision-making. In India, the second example is with the Telangana state government. Telangana is home to 35 million Indians, talk about scale. Uh, and the state government is interested in improving its results-based budgeting. And it also runs a lot of social programs around nutrition, health, and education, and programs targeted at pregnant and lactating women, including the, the one that I featured just a minute ago. The state government agencies want to understand who's enrolling in programs, what their experiences are with these programs, and what are outcomes associated with these programs. So Data on Demand in India is collecting data from 60,000 households across these sectors and working directly with multiple state level agencies to put these data into use. The third example is from Kenya. I was so happy to see one of our participants is, is calling in from Kenya, welcome. Uh, DOD there is uh, here is in initial discussions with the State Department of Social Protection. This is not yet a confirmed engagement, but we are pursuing it with great interest. Um, the State Department for Social Protection here is building a universal beneficiary registry that would be the sole source of truth for targeting all social protection programs, both those funded and implemented by the Kenyan government and those funded and implemented by external development partners. So this is the most pivotal decision that SDSP is trying to make every day, which is where to allocate scarce resources to people who are experiencing poverty shocks, natural disasters, extreme vulnerability. Unfortunately, the data that they're working with now is relatively poor quality, which really 
is a risk <laughs> because if you're using the wrong data to allocate scarce resources to people in need, you can really go wrong. So we are hoping to support them in collecting data to build the registry and to bolster their own data systems uh, and data quality systems. So this is an example of how high stakes it can be to get the right data for decision making. So that's lesson two, take the data to decisions. Uh, let's turn to the third and last lesson, which is around institutionalizing data use. By this, I mean working with government partners to strengthen their own systems for data collection, for awareness and appreciation of data, and for use. This allows us to move beyond just discrete decisions with data to bolstering systems and practices that public sector agencies use over time to make all sorts of decisions. So I'm gonna share two examples of this. The first again from the Philippines. So in the partnership with the Department of Health uh, on the Health Promotion and Literacy Survey, the DOD team was asked by the Department of Health to work with a number of LGUs to bolster their own data practices. And the goal here is for LGUs to conduct their own, to eventually conduct their own health literacy assessment. And one hope here is that locally generated data is more likely to be used for local decision making. And it sounds like we have a lot to learn from CBMS on that front. Uh, so DOD team in, in the Philippines is gonna be working directly with several LGUs to diagnose their capacity for local data collection. And based on that, help them strengthen their capacity to conduct their own uh, health literacy assessments. So the second example of institutionalizing data use comes from India. Uh, our DOD team there is supporting the Aspirational Districts Program. This is run by a government agency called Niti Aayog, and it aims to improve performance on social and economic outcomes in 112 of India's most vulnerable districts. Data is at the heart of ADP with a focus on monitoring a common set of socioeconomic indicators across districts to track progress and to create a bit of a race to the top. I was interested to hear Dr. Reyes um, refer to one of the, the uh, provinces using the CBMS data to kind of compete with their peer provinces and a similar spirit is behind ADP. And as you can see from these headlines, ADP is really a large scale, high stakes experiment in data-driven decision-making and governance reform in India. One of the downsides, however, is that the data that they're using to track progress and to kind of rank districts across each other is really quite poor. The administrative data being generated by districts is really quite poor. And that happens for a number of reasons. In some cases, there's just gaps in the data chain. You all know what it takes to get data intact from the point of collection, be it a facility or a household, up until it's being reported at the district and national level. Or to be honest, there might be some bad incentives, right? If you're using data to rank and compare, there's a lot of incentive to inflate your data so that your socioeconomic outcomes look better than they really are. But the fact of the matter is that bad data threatens the whole logic and impact of ADP. And so the data on demand team in India is working with the ADP districts to improve their own data systems. So we're using our survey data to spot check their administrative data. So we collect data directly from sampled facilities and beneficiaries, and then we calculate the mismatch between what our data say and what the facility administrative data say. And that mismatch gives us the opportunity to advise district magistrates and their offices um, about how to improve their data collection and quality, and to actually give them diagnostic tools to use in an ongoing way to ensure data quality improvements over time. This kind of institutional change is really hard and really slow, but ultimately really important for fostering data use that is sustained over time. So those are my three lessons. I just wanna close by saying what a joy it is to be here with you today. I'm excited for our teams to stay connected. I have always believed that it is easier to foster public sector use of data and evidence if we work together in community, we create kind of collective support and collective accountability for transparent and effective use of data and evidence. But even if we're wildly successful in that endeavor, endeavor there's, there's really no point at which governments are done, right? There's no point at which there's enough use of data and evidence such that outside actors like us won't be important, both in terms of supporting and encouraging a data-driven culture and holding governments accountable or empowering citizens to hold governments accountable for it. 
that's a really big job and we need allies. And so I'm hoping that together we can uh, collaborate and share some lessons. Uh, I invite you all to be in active touch with the DOD team in the Philippines. And I really look forward to the rest of our conversation today. Back to you, Aya. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, really interested to pick up on this last piece on the role of the community in really fostering data use and, um, and evidence use in, in the public sector. So hopefully we can discuss this, that in the panel discussion later. Um, so you know, before we go to the panel discussion, um, we will be hearing from two reactors. While we're hearing from the reactors, participants can feel free to send their questions. We're already seeing a lot and we'll hope to answer um, maybe at least the most common questions that we see. So please feel free to, to send them in uh, for a panel discussion later. So our first reactor is Dr. Imelda Dela. Uh, Dr. Dela is an associate professor at the Ateneo School of Government and the, and the convener of Voces Filipinas. She specializes in the rule of law and democracy in Southeast Asia with a focus on judicial politics, legal pluralism, and civil society military relations in Mindanao. She's currently working on projects related to misinformation, public opinion, and electoral violence. Dr. Dana is also a developmental lawyer and is working on a justice and human rights program in the Bangsamoro region. Voces Pilipinas is short for Voces Opinion Siasat Achencha para sa Pilipinas. It is the first university-based opinion and survey research unit established in the Philippines that aims to advance empirical, interdisciplinary, and policy-oriented studies of public opinion on democracy, governance, and development. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Imelda Dela. Thank you, Aya, for that uh, very generous introduction. And um, thank you for uh, ID Insight, uh, Philippine Institute for uh, Development Studies and uh, the Ateneo School of Government for inviting me to uh, participate in this very important and timely um, discussion. I really enjoyed um, listening to the two presenters and I learned a lot uh, from the presentations uh, given that the work that we do uh, with Bosses Filipinas and with the Ateneo Policy Center. Uh, we are interested very much into um, data, uh, generating data ourselves and using that uh, to, uh, to develop our research uh, that we hope to uh, contribute uh, to good policies uh, in, in the Philippines. But let me uh, deliver my <laughs> two cents worth uh, response to the presentations. Uh, the two presentations are very rich and uh, are very useful. Uh, I would say that, um, and I'm very, and the first uh, uh, point that I'd like to, to say is that I, I'm really glad um, to hear no, uh, from two uh, speakers um, in highlighting the fact that uh, data and uh, the use of data for policy is not just an issue for uh, of uh, technology as most people uh, generally understand it to be. Um, as we have seen from the presentations, um, data is part of uh, the broader political and social conditions in, in, in the country. Um, and so um, there are actually, um, and, and so data can only be useful, no? uh, and it can only be impactful if, if it can be used. However, um, data uh, or its non-use can be traced to a lot of factors. There are what we call facilitators uh, to data use, but also barriers. And there are uh, a lot of uh, barriers than facilitators, actually. And um, I think that the, the presentation already uh, discussed uh, these innovations no, to, um, to actually overcome barriers to uh, knowledge of and use of data. It was highlighted by both presentations, the need for collaboration and building relationships as uh, a major facilitator of uh, data use. Um, and, and from some other studies, you know, it, it was shown that uh, the existence of and access to data is very important. The two presentations, again, uh, highlighted the fact that in many developing countries like India and the Philippines, 
uh, there is not much data actually, and that there is a need to generate data. Uh, and how to generate data, uh, which entails a lot of cost, is again a barrier to actually uh, uh, the use of data per policy. Uh, it was also highlighted that uh, it's not only data per se that we sh that is important for policy. In fact, as we know, for uh, with the policymakers around uh, in this seminar. Uh, we can see that the policy cycle, the policy process uh, demands uh, more than um, data. Um, it is embedded in the political, social, and economic uh, conditions or, or context. Um, but again, uh, it starts from data and we need quality and responsive data for it to be useful. Again, studies have shown that um, hesitance to use data uh, is due to the fact that many people perceive that uh, they are not credible. Uh, in fact, uh, bias, uh, perception of bias um, is also cited as one of the barriers uh, to using data. Um, we know that in the Philippines, as in India, uh, we know the context no, of uh, weak or poor institutions uh, with very un untransparent processes. And uh, policymakers uh, also uh, have a lot of things to do no, with uh, uh, in the decision to use or use data. Um, and that is because of their own interests, beliefs, and values. And so uh, we reflect on uh, the incentives or what, we, what can we do to motiv motivate our policymakers to actually use data is something that, uh, needs to, that we need to, to be thinking uh, a lot more. Uh, for example, uh, I saw this article that shows that, uh, in fact, highly educated uh, policymakers uh, are actually barriers to using data. Maybe you can, you know, uh, you can uh, probably uh, uh, see the reason why behind that. And but um, this study that I saw also showed that actually young female uh, policymakers are more predisposed to using data than their uh, male counterparts, uh, which leads me also to think about the role of academics like us, no, uh, in data, uh, but also in in ensuring that our data. Uh, and research uh, become meaningful and useful to policymakers because we know for a fact that we have uh, the same limitations. Um, uh, uh, we have also a lot of limitations no, on how we can actually be useful. Uh, one of that is the demand for uh, Scopus Index uh, articles. No? And we know that it's not, most of the times, it's not the kind of uh, data that a poly policymakers would want to use or see. Uh, and so uh, it, it, we, uh, we need we need to challenge ourselves, uh, academics. No, uh, uh, how we can actually bridge uh, the academic and the policy community, and that is uh, one is actually uh, by thinking of ways how we can we can effectively communicate our research, and uh, how we can actually uh, come up with different knowledge formats that could be actually be more usable and more accessible to policymakers. Um, it was also shown no, of in, in some of the, uh, the research that in, particularly in the, in the context of uh, the, uh, developing countries uh, where um, political leadership, community leadership and existence of policy entrepreneurs could overcome barriers. And I think these three elements are actually exemplified by the CFBMS. Uh, we have shown also that, uh, and I really, uh, really appreciate uh, the work of the CBMS in this, in that it's not only limited to data collection and monitoring, but also uh, performs a function of uh, generating or strengthening the agency and empowering the community by being participants, direct participants in uh, data collection. And of course, in demanding that, uh, that uh, uh, they demand uh, the services that they need. And so this leads me to uh, the second reaction, which is that's already been uh, articulated by our presenters uh, on the need to, to foster a culture of data, uh, a culture of data literacy, especially on um, the current situation you know, where, uh, uh, where misinformation, fake news proliferate, um, but also uh, there is actually an explosion of information you know, and uh, sources of data that we can see you know, in the internet. 
um, it also uh, made me reflect that in today's uh, modern world, uh, there is also a need to recognize uh, that uh, policy actors are beyond the uh, policy makers itself no, in the government, but actually extends to a broad range of actors. And so um, in terms of education and fostering this uh, culture of education, we need to be reaching out to different sectors. Uh, the civil society, of course, uh, is an important partner, but also the public. Uh, we should not uh, forget that the public and also, of course, uh, uh, a lot of interest groups who are interested in shaping or influencing policy, uh, uh, that they, they be encouraged you know, and motivated to actually use data uh, in their policy decisions. Um, Lastly, I think uh, the movement, you know, these innovative uh, innovations in, in data, in data collection and data use, uh, hopefully uh, could contribute to the great, the broader trend towards uh, open uh, data and open government, uh, which I think is becoming um, an important or crucial uh, to modern governments uh, in view of uh, the different challenges and complexities of uh, governance and uh, policy issues. Um, but uh, I would say that uh, data can only be powerful no? uh, as a tool no? uh, or as a powerful resource if, if, it, can, if, if it can be actually uh, transparent. And of, uh, there's a way to measure progress and that we can see commitment from our uh, political leadership, uh, from the LGUs, uh, which is now being done through the CMBMS, um, and the community no, uh, in providing um, uh, organizational and te technical uh, capacity. I think it's really very important, as mentioned by Sarah, uh, the provision of uh, technical capacity uh, to our stakeholders. I think uh, in some, I'd like to say that uh, in the end, we need, uh, we need to be really thinking uh, of the way data can actually uh, transform no, about the way uh, people understand uh, democracy and its practices and, and uh, policy making. And uh, I think the operative word here is relevant, timely, uh, credible data uh, that can inform uh, them and their decisions uh, and their uh, participation in government processes. That's all. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dana. Um, really interested to hear your perspective on on the on data generation and use, um, how and we how we can empower communities more. Our next reactor is Dr. Robin Garcia. Uh, Dr. Robin Garcia is the founder and chairman of WR Numero Research, president and CEO of WR Advisory Group, and an, an assistant professor at the University of Asia and the Pacific. Dr. Garcia specializes in political psychology and international relations theory with a focus on Southeast Asia, China, and the Philippines. He has written for various publications and advised government leaders and multinational companies on political ec economic developments. Most recently, he was among the 25 fellows selected for the prestigious Eisenhower Global 2023 program. WR Numerator Research is a technology-driven polling and data analytics company that provides accurate, independent, and actionable data insights. WRN combines social scientific expertise with technology to enable better political public relations and policy decisions every day. Please welcome Dr. Robin Garcia. Thank you, um, Aya. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much to the Philippine Institute for uh, Development Studies and thank you to the Ateneo School of Government for organizing this very important discussion on the use of data um, for, for policies and uh, for development policies and uh, for government use. Um, I'm speaking in behalf of my firm, uh, WR Numero Research. Um, as, as, as was mentioned, uh, we definitely use technology to, to do social research. I'll be sharing more of that later. But let me first respond to the um, comments of our two excellent speakers, uh, Dr. Celia Reyes and Sarah Lucas. Um, I'd like to begin with uh, Dr. Celia Reyes. Um, uh, you know, 
the 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 very important thing that that she she pointed out are the gaps in in research and therefore we definitely have to pursue um innovations in in, in social research such as the CBMS um especially at the local level um and the you know the the municipal level and the barangay level i'm very happy to know that the CBMS has been legislated at the national level and that will definitely help in institutionalizing um you know uh, research um, in general, but specifically research coming from the local government units. I'd also like to say um, that this is such an important development, uh, the use of CBMS, uh, because there's a big debate, of course, uh, in, in development studies about the, the imposition of um, one-size-fits-all development policies and development models. And so if you really look at the data and the experiences from the local level, what you do really is to create a nuanced picture of development realities on the ground. And therefore, what that gives you is a, 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 a something closer to an indigenous um, model that really fits um, the local level and the, the, that responds very, very closely to the experiences of of uh, of barangays and municipalities and we we'd like to say that you know uh these development realities are actually quite unique on their own um while national government responses are important local government responses are important as well um and that's that's the whole point of decentralization and therefore the fierce debate about federalism how far can you really nuance your development responses um is a national issue even with the the constitutional convention that we have now um, and of course, a, a, an advocate of federalism um, is currently in the Senate. But it, whether or not development and political models uh, do respond to the, the goal of nuancing uh, uh, development models, the issue is at least we know what's happening on the ground. And I'm very happy that CBMS is able to achieve that, even if it's quite a new uh, innovation at the national level. Um, I'd like to commend as well um, the, the presentation of uh, Sarah Lucas. Um, it's definitely in line as well with innovation and social research. Um, I completely agree that relevance and reliability um, is achieved through data quality, through, through timeliness and, and representation. And something I'd like to say uh, today actually is the issue of timeliness um, because of the methodologies that we were stuck with um uh uh for 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 several decades now we, we we've been stuck with pen and paper surveys i'm happy that there's a a innovations in um capi or computer assisted personal interviews and the use of machine learning in processing the data and therefore making data processing quicker and would definitely deliver um the the analysis uh from that data to to decision makers quickly so that's that's uh, definitely in line with some of the things that we do and what we believe in uh, WR Numero um, about the use of technology, about the use of proprietary softwares to 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 make sure that the social research is is um, uh, done properly and 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 uh, in, in a very timely manner. I mean, of course, both speakers talked about the importance of data and how we can get uh, you know reliable and fast results, but. Um, Maybe that's, uh, I'll jump off to my last point. Uh, it, it, it's not, I, I have several things to say, but my last point talks about um, supposedly the, the barriers to, to, to data use. And what I'd say is that we definitely need a cognitive shift, um, it, you know, a cr creating, uh, uh, making society understand or appreciate the value of research in general, not just data. Universities have a huge role to play here. Um, and you, you have state universities at the local level. Uh, so, so, so they're very important as well. But of course you have the Department of Education, you have the Commission on Higher Education. All of those institutions have to foster the culture of research, the importance of research. Um, I, I'm also an academic and one of the things that, that I, I, um, I see as a challenge in, in fostering a culture of research is that research is seen as un unglamorous um, 
uh, uh, vocation. That if you say that you're a researcher, it's you know you're you, you're not as 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 important as a doctor, as a lawyer, or or many other uh, professions, right? So the the term research is that is is not a a, a we we can improve uh, on how um, the the term researcher research is is uh, 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 is used or is, is appreciated by society, but at the same time, it's not just about the the social or structural barriers to appreciating research, but researchers themselves have to be able to communicate data properly, and this is where data visualization comes in. Um, you cannot just you know, present data in an Excel file, for example, if we if if, if really have want to be direct. Um, we there are softwares, for example, that, that can be used to present data properly. We can also use narratives um, uh, uh, to, to, to accompany uh, that data. So beyond just presenting data in an Excel file, we, we have to put more effort in data storytelling and, and making sense of that data. So it goes beyond just data analysis, but really communicating that data towards an audience that would, uh, uh, towards your specific audience. And of course there are challenges to, to, um, to communicating that to policymakers. The second point uh, supposedly that, that I was gonna say is that um, the, specifically for opinion research, a lot of elected policymakers see it just as a tool for electoral success, not for policy and development success. And that's quite important uh, because if they only appreciate survey use for, uh, for, for elections, and that happens every three years, and the quality of public policies and development models will definitely be affected. We will not be able to maximize uh, policies, uh, you know, the, the, the use of data for, for public policies, if that's the cognitive orientation of, um, of elected officials, now, that they would just use it for, for, for elections. Um, but, but also, finally, I'd like to say that from the experience we had with WR Numero Research, we, we, we believe in bringing novel technologies um, uh, and novel methods that are used in advanced democracies to, to the Philippines. Um, one of the ways we do that is through big data analytics. So for example, we've done, uh, we've conducted big data analytics research for an, about human rights narratives for an international organization. Um, it was aimed towards promoting social and behavioral change um, of human rights organizations. Well, and then we definitely, we continue to, uh, to use big data analytics to help human rights organizations in the digital space. We've also done um, nationally, representative, uh, nationally representative digital surveys um, during the elections. Um, in the Philippines, nationally, uh, digital surveys abound, but they're not naturally, they're not nationally representative. So it's, it's um, abused by, by a lot of organizations for electoral ends, but there is a lot of power in digital surveys, it gives you very, very quick results. Huge organizations such as YouGov and Ipsos um, have their own nationally representative panels. And uh, you know that we, we hope that that's something that we, that, um, that more uh, Philippine organizations uh, are, are able to use and appreciate and not just uh, computer assisted personal interviews. Um, there is a way to make digital surveys nationally representative Pew Research Center has come out with um, actually a lot of research about um, uh, how to make digital surveys nationally representative. So these are the types of methodologies that are used in the United States or in the UK. Um, and I'm sure maybe Sarah um, knows some of these things, uh, some of these methodologies, but uh, based on our experience, uh, digital surveys offer one of the ways to, to be fast um, in, in data delivery and data analysis. In fact, I think we were the only firm that did weekly surveys um, during the elections. Um, but not only that, um, the, the, the work that we do, as, my, as I mentioned, is based on the vision of bringing novel methods and novel technologies um, and maximizing essentially opportunities in the digital age and industry 2.0. So in opinion research, we've seen a lot of innovations in this space. 
So for example, uh, we, we've we seen innovations using text, text messaging in surveys. So that's supposed to bridge um, uh, the, the issue of um, uh, people who are not online and cutting out the, the enumerators for potential um, uh, biases, um, social desirability biases, uh, especially in time of political autocracy, for example, you will have some issues with, um, with the data gathering because the respondents might not be too, too truthful in the face of fear. Uh, retaliation by the state. So that's that's one issue that that uh, text messaging and digital surveys are able to solve the issue of social desirability bias and the Hawthorne effect. Um, and of course, we've also seen mobile phone surveys either through uh, with the use of internet or through calls. Um, but one of the exciting innovations that we've 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 started to do is. Uh, uh, can be can be seen in two two ways. One is automated content analysis, as well as um, general innovations in neuro linguistic programming, um, looking at the data in 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 the digital sphere, such as Facebook, Twitter, email, um, uh, uh, Google searches, and Yahoo searches, and and the like. Generally, social listening um, and using uh, computers and computing to be able to get and aggregate and parse through the sentiments of people. So um, these innovations are being used in advanced democracies. There are um, uh, development organizations that have started to use NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming and Automated Content Analysis. This is exactly what we did for, uh, as I mentioned um, on big data uh, for human rights organizations in understanding the narratives of human rights organizations in the time um, of, of some political persecution on human rights issues. Um, and so uh, I'd like to end there, but maybe just, just, a, just a final word. Um, I'm very happy that the speakers have, have emphasized the need for innovative methods in itself, um, as well as um, technology-driven innovations in data gathering. So these are all important to, 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 um, to empower the culture of research and, and to empower researchers themselves um, for better policies and for better, for to create better development models. Um, and uh, we've seen exciting things happening, not just today uh, uh, with ID Insight and the CBMS, but also in other areas with the use of computing um, the 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 marrying of um, computer science and social science is something that we've seen uh, um, as a trend. Banking on industry to uh, industry 4.0, as well as uh, banking on the opportunities that the digital age can bring to social research. So thank you very much for this opportunity, and uh, congratulations to the organizers. Thank you very much, Dr. Garcia. Really interesting perspectives on the, especially on the innovation side. Um, at this point, I'd like to invite our speakers um, and our reactors to actually join us for the panel discussion, where we'll get the, a chance to further discuss some of the points you raised earlier, and as well answer some of the questions from our participants. We are getting a lot of questions from our participants, very lively discussion actually in the chat if you're following. Um, and so we'd like to tackle a few of them in the next uh, maybe 10 to 15 minutes um, since we're running a little bit late. Um, so joining us on the panel actually on behalf of Dr. Reyes and CBMS is um, Ms. Anne Bernadette Mandap. Um, Bernadette is a research and program officer at the CBMS network office in Manila. She has worked on various research collaborations at the local and international level on the development and institutionalization of CBMS. Those applications include poverty and vulnerability analysis, um, gender and development, migration and development, localizing the Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals, impact monitoring, and monitoring child labor, among others. Thank you very much for joining us, Bernadette. Um, I'd like to remind participants again on Zoom that you can send your questions via the comment box. Um, and those on Facebook can also send their questions 
via the live comments. Um, and so, yeah, we can get started in our panel discussion. So, you know, there, there was a lot of information that was shared earlier. Um, and really, this idea of fostering data use by the public sector has a lot of dimensions, including how we collect and present data, how we encourage data use in government, and how we work with each other to strengthen that um, culture of use. So I think we'll touch on that a little bit in the next few minutes. Um, we can start with collecting and presenting data. Um, so we've heard from CBMS and DOD and um, Bosses Filipinas and WRN as well. Um, one of the one of the main questions that are that, that's coming up in in the um, in the comments from uh, the participants is to understand how we can make CBMS in particular, but also data collection in general less costly or resource intensive. Um, so you know, resources being a big barrier to data collection. Um, curious about your thoughts on that. And also, in particular, for um, for Bernadette for CBMS, um, I think a resounding question is whether data collected through CBMS can be available for public use, and how um, how researchers can access CBMS. Um, so maybe Bernadette, you can get us started. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And once again, uh, on behalf of Dr. Reyes, we'd like to thank. Um, uh, our friends from Ateneo School of Government, ID Insight, um, and PIDS for uh, inviting us to this forum. So um, just to uh, answer uh, the question, um, um, the question was uh, how to make CBMS less costly. Is that, is that it? <laughs> Did I get the question correctly? Yes. Uh, yes. And like right, data maybe, collection in general, how to make that more, data collection less in costly general, more accessible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe I could provide an idea uh, of our like ballpark figure of of the cost of implementing CBMS in our in our case. Like um, uh, at the time when we were um, spearheading the the, the the implementation of CBMS in the country, our estimate is that um, to be able to uh, implement the whole system from collecting data to processing of the data, generation of the maps, establishment of the database, and including the capacity building of the local governments. The cost was around um, 175 to 200 pesos per household, uh, or around maybe four, is that $4 uh, per household? So when, when you think about it, um, actually when you weigh the benefits, from the uh, uh, when we weigh the benefits vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, the cost of implementing uh, the system, um, uh, most of the LGUs that have implemented it actually find it uh, cost effective in the sense that you get to use the data that you generated for for a lot of a lot of things. But I guess uh, in terms of some of the strategies that have been adopted uh, by our uh, local partners in the uh, implementation of uh, CBMS in particular, um, they've managed to uh, bring down the cost by uh, tapping uh, existing LGU personnel. I think this was uh, uh, also mentioned and highlighted uh, in Dr. Reyes' presentation earlier. Uh, so CBMS was designed in that way that uh, uh, we use um, uh, like uh, enumerators from the communities. In some LGUs, they use um, their scholars, uh, their, their, their scholars, uh, meaning students that they fund from um, the LGU uh, uh, scholarship programs, their uh, on-the-job trainees. Um, in some localities, they use the barangay health workers or the village health workers um, or the village nutrition scholars. Um, in terms of, of uh, data processors, they use uh, existing LGU personnel, usually uh, from the uh, existing planning units. They make use of their, their, their existing um, uh, equipments in the conduct of, of training. So many ways to to um, many ways and strategies um, that can be adopted to bring down uh, the cost for for collecting uh, and implementing a, a monitoring system like a CBMS. Thanks so much, Bernadette. Do you also want to respond to the other question on 
whether CBMS data is available for public use and how researchers can access CBMS data if it is. Yeah, actually, in the in the earlier years, um, of course, when we when we were managing the the database of of the of the uh, CBMS uh, network. Um, the data can be uh, requested through our office. But um, uh, over time, uh, the protocol has changed. Um, um, they can directly access the, the data from the LGU. Usually, from it's, it's lodged in the planning units, especially those that have already installed their CBMS prior to the CBMS law. So uh, most of the researchers that approach our office, we direct them to the uh, focal persons from the LGU uh, since uh, or focal offices from the LGU because uh, their data are are with them, they 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 have access to their own data sets. Great, thank you so much, uh, Renidad. And so I'm curious. Um, I'll call on Robin to see if he has thoughts on whether innovation can make um, data collection costs less cost. Uh, yeah, data collection costs lower. Um, if there are any opportunities that that you see there, maybe not for CBMS in particular, but in, mm -hmm. for data collection in general. Um, I'd say two things in this. Thank you, um, Aya. The first one is if you use um, survey methods that don't need the numerators, then you cut costs on um, on traveling and training and things like that and personal costs. You know, so you do that through digital surveys, panels that you can make nationally representative. Of course, you need more methodological innovations to make um, online panels nationally representative, but it is possible if you know how to do uh, that. And uh, as you've seen with 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 uh, the presentation of Sarah, there are you know even with uh, computer personal interviews, there are challenges to national representation, but there are ways to overcome that. Uh, but the point is, um, digital surveys uh, surveys that use text messaging uh, that use phone calls, they 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 cut a lot of costs and therefore make make the the the, the results cheaper um the the other thing would be of course digital sentiments are readily available so um it it it, it makes the the costs faster uh, i mean it, it makes the results faster the costs lower but the startup costs of creating that technology is higher uh because if especially if you want to create proprietary technology for social listening that will use artificial intelligence and machine learning, then you, you know you you would definitely have to to um to to invest a lot there. There are firms uh, who offer those technologies for a subscription subscription basis. So these are software software as a service firms. So um, I mean those those uh, those business models abound. But if you are an organization who who definitely want to be a leader in that space, and you would have to invest. But in the long run, um, you'd have economies of scale. In the long run, uh, these these methods can can prove to be cheaper and faster. Thanks so much, Robin. Um, I'll now turn to Sarah to ask. Also, you know, I think with with data on demand, lowering cost has been a really core part of the. The mission there, but it's not easy. So I want to invite Sarah to speak about what challenges um, there are in lowering costs um, in data collection. And I'll, I'll also start transitioning into another topic. Um, so Sarah, if you can also address this. Um, but in terms of data use, um, a question from the audience is about selecting indicators that are relevant for decision making. Um, how, how do we do that? Um, so, for example, for the aspirational districts program, what financial indicators did the DOD team focus on? Um, but in general, how do we prioritize um, indicators that are really more relevant? Thank you, Aya. Uh, in terms of costs, yeah, we've set out with data on demand to optimize across cost, speed, and quality. And we're finding that the hardest of those three factors to move is cost. Uh, but there are things that we are putting into place in DOD. I mentioned several of them in my presentation, but just to rearticulate, in some cases, having standing networks of enumerators and supervisors so that the effort and the cost associated with identifying people every time is reduced. 
We are streamlining survey management um, through SurveyStream, which in theory should allow it to be less people dependent to make assignments and reassignments and things of that nature. So the survey management is streamlined. Um, the sampling methods is a big one. I mean, doing if you are actually doing household listings across large geographies, if you're um, using that as a sampling frame, it's really quite expensive. And so we're hoping as we refine particularly the grid-based sampling method that that would allow us to do high quality representative sampling uh, much more quickly and more cheaply. Uh, I will say though, you know, because I mean, Dr. Garcia has made this point, if you're working through enumerators, you know, there's some binding constraints in terms of speed, in terms of quality, in terms of cost. And we are finding, you know, we're hiring in India thousands of enumerators um, in a go. And, you know, you have to comply with all employment regulations, all legal uh, expectations about being able to hire a workforce across the country. And that actually is not a, a cheap endeavor, nor do we want it to be, right? Like we're not trying to skirt any of that. And so there are some, depending on your geography, some binding constraints to, to um, cost reductions. I will say that there are, you know, DOD, unlike CBMS, which is three decades old, we're a couple years old in India and brand new in a couple of geographies. And so the efficiencies that we're gaining over time, I think are gonna greatly uh, help us on the cost front. I do want to flip this around a little bit. I was so grateful, Bernadette, for your commentary that really CBMS is costs about $4 per household, <laughs> soup to nuts which if you think about the potential value of that data is really a very, very low cost. And so part of this is also shifting the framing. We have a responsibility to use resources wisely and carefully and to push down costs where we can. Um, and I think we have an opportunity in community to raise awareness about the value of using data and evidence for decision-making and to help people think about the cost benefit uh, analysis, not just the cost. And one thing that we could all be a lot better at is almost monetizing the value of using data for decision making in the public sector. It is a colossal waste of public resources to target programs poorly, to continue programs that don't work. And so if we can identify and articulate the real downside loss of resources by not using data, I think that we can help build demand and some tolerance for paying for data. Because frankly, if you do it well, it's not free. There are so many companies in the world right now that are claiming to collect data at extremely low cost and with very little discussion about the value and utility of that data and also the quality. And so for us, that optimizing across the three is really important. We are not trying to drive down costs at all costs. We're trying to really make sure that we are uh, managing across those three dimensions. Um, and then in terms of the uh, in terms of the how do you identify indicators, I mean, in the first round of ADP, the indicators were determined by what uh, the program itself was trying to measure and include in their rankings. And what we identified over time is that the cost of collecting across all of those was really prohibitive. And so we've worked with Niti Aayog um, and district level officials to understand what are the indicators that are going to give us kind of a comprehensive look at where the potential data gaps are. So in, in the ADP case, it's less about using the data that we're collecting for decision making. It's about using the data that we're collecting for diagnosing data gaps and, um, and poor quality. And so that's very different, for example, than in the Telangana state government, where they directly want to use DOD survey data for decision making in their social sector programming. And I would say that one of the challenges here <laughs> is that public sector partners, I mean no harm here, but are really good at dreaming up all the data that they want and less good about really being rigorous and saying, actually, these are the data points that I need for these particular decisions. And so there's just a constant engagement to be like, okay, well, if we collect everything you want, I, I think in Telangana, when we started out, there were something like 500 indicators that would create a survey that it took five and a half hours to implement. And so then it's really a conversation about which of these are decision essential versus nice to have, because as quite a few of our speakers today have identified, if you're drowning in data, you don't use it. 
And so really targeting and aligning the data that you need for a decision with what you collect and letting go of some of the other pieces. I think there's quite a bit of art to that in working with public sector, really any social sector partner. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I'll turn to Imet for some thoughts um, on this aspect of um, using data. And if you have any reflections on um, you know, what it takes, what kind of data to collect, what it takes to, um, to provide data that is actually actionable for policymakers. Uh, thank you, Aya. Uh, I think for us, no, we work in uh, the academic space, but we are also very much engaged with uh, uh, engaging with policy and policymakers. So we ensure uh, that our research is actually data driven. Um, but we need to remember that data is only part of uh, decision making no? or policy making. So uh, for, for that uh, to actually make an impact on decision making uh, or to be considered in decision making, uh, it needs to be well thought of no? or part of a broader of, of, of a problem. So for us, what we do no? uh, in order to really uh, generate uh, useful indicators is to come up no? uh, with a really good research question and a series of questions uh, that would guide us uh, in uh, doing our surveys, for example. So we're not just going out there no, to survey people, uh, to, to just get their opinion. We're actually thinking about what to survey, what it is for. So the first thing actually to do is uh, to think about what it is meant for. Um, otherwise, uh, we're just be, you're, you'll just be collecting um, uh, a, a, a host of data that are not useful. So, and uh, we should know that uh, in terms of cost, no, uh, the shorter your uh, survey uh, instrument is, is the better, no? Uh, because uh, long surveys actually cost more. So what we do is to ensure that we actually are, you know, uh, make sure that uh, our uh, questionnaire is actually a little bit more, uh, are, are precise, no? Our questionnaires are, are crafted more precisely, uh, but uh, by ensuring that we, we are asking the proper questions in the first place. And uh, really, really thinking about the purpose of why we're gathering the data. But uh, having said that also, um, our task is also to unpack, no? to make sense the data. So it's not just the data per se, the numbers, no? uh, the numerics, but really behind to explain uh, what the numbers are for. So in the, in, in, in the case of Bosses Filipinas, we have done surveys no? on uh, misinformation. And we actually use digital surveys, online platforms. Uh, that's actually cost effective because we are not resource. No, uh, we don't have that much resources. Uh, but we on, we ensure that also in terms of our methodology, uh, like uh, our statisticians are actually um, using more techniques. Or, uh, for example, in terms of weights. No, uh, so uh, my, my my our statistician has just come up with this brilliant idea of use, using this innovative weight to actually minimize bias. Um, at the same time, in terms of analysis, uh, we're really, really looking at uh, different uh, uh, innovations there, no? Uh, not just using probably regression or something like that, no? Uh, but we, we, we make it a point uh, that really that our data can speak to, uh, to ordinary people. Um, and again, uh, in terms of uh, our research on misinformation, uh, we actually produce different knowledge uh, products. Uh, for example, uh, we use uh, uh, media media uh, briefers. Uh, we do interviews. We go out there to actually communicate our research. Uh, but we also um, use uh, uh, accessible uh, papers. For example, working papers are more accessible actually to uh, to the users than uh, journal or peer reviewed articles. Uh, and it, because also peer reviewed articles are also very expensive, no? Uh, not ma many people actually have use of peer reviewed journals. Um, and so uh, we're still trying to come up really with more accessible materials. But having said th this, I also wanted to, uh, to say, and uh, some of my colleagues could, can refute me, is that there are also uh, research that actually don't need no representative uh, uh, some samples or uh, data, representative data. Uh, in fact, some of our, in our research, no, we we use uh, snowball sampling. No, so it really depends on your research, no, and you don't need to spend more. Uh, in terms of our election-related violence research, we actually uh, use no uh, technology to actually scrape uh, news reports uh, to generate the data that we want uh, to show patterns and trends no, in elect election-related violence across the, the country. 
Um, so there are actually many ways no, to generate data and uh, it's not only limited no, to, to actually doing uh, representative uh, surveys. No? Uh, I wanted to, uh, to, to emphasize that, but there are also a lot of data out there. So in, uh, with my students, when I'm actually talking to them, I told them actually that you don't have to do uh, uh, to generate uh, primary data yourself. There are a range of secondary data that have been already collected by different agencies, and all you have to do is to go out there and uh, look for it. Uh, but having said this again, I know sometimes our uh, uh, institutions actually have problems with transparency, or you know, problems with uh, transparent uh, access uh, ac accessing their uh, their data. And so, uh, for me, it's really uh, an advocacy for me, no, uh, with respect to our government institutions, uh, in making their data uh, publicly and readily available without any uh, bureaucratic and legal constraints. Thank you very much. Um, we do have many questions left, but unfortunately, that's all the time that we have today. Um, I think one key highlight that I wanted to make was that it seems very clear from the different perspectives that we heard today that there really is a lot of room for different actors to be part of this community, to really work collaboratively and, and, and complement with each other to help shift the culture of the public sector towards evidence use and to also help in building capacity um, of, of government towards data use. Um, so I want to thank our amazing panel for their insights and our audience for their active participation in the rich discussion. Um, if your answer, if your questions were not answered, um, you, you may reach out to, to the team for, for us to see if we can respond to those questions after. Uh, but before we officially close the program, I'd like to call on the president of PIDS, Dr. Aniceta Arbeta Jr., to give the closing remarks. Uh, good afternoon to uh, speakers, uh, curious participants, and those watching on Facebook. I thank uh, our event partners, the IA Insight, the Ateneo School of Governments, Ateneo Policy Center, for this uh, fruitful collaboration. Our synergies resulted in this timely webinar from which we can glean some important lessons. Today, we learned that addressing data gaps using technology enabled systems, especially at the household and community levels facilitates more informed, efficient, and effective policy-making, planning, budgeting, uh, implementation, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. The examples given to us under the Multi-Based Monitoring Systems, or CPMS, and the Data on Demand by ID Insights Project have shown how relevant and reliable data inform government decisions at the local and national levels and create responsive plans, especially during times of crisis like COVID-19 pandemic. When this happens, we use resources better, houses, households and communities cooperate in program implementation, and we can monitor and analyze better the impact of public policies. Experiences presented today also showed us that local government units and the national government could invest willingly in technology-enabled data generation systems when they recognize the value of having rich and disaggregated data. The value of local level data is great enough for the CBMS case that the bill passed into law in just seven months, which is remarkably fast for policy advocacy. Today, CBMS is implemented in 29 countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Beyond the numbers, the best impact of local level data for policy making brings is facilitating greater transparency and accountability in public service, making citizens feel and know that they truly matter. These are our best motivations in public service and development work. We hope to, that today's seminar has helped our government, civil society, academic, and private sector participants better appreciate data's role in policy making and program design and become even more effective partners in development. Together, let's work and use better data and crafting policies and programs to help reinvigorate job creation and accelerate poverty reduction. Thank you, and I wish all of you a blessing. Thank you very much, Dr. Urbeta. Um, that brings us to the end of our program. On behalf of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, the Ateneo School of Government and ID Insight, I'd like to thank all our speakers and participants across Zoom and Facebook 
for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'd like to ask our speakers and partners to stay on a little bit longer to for a quick photo opportunity. Uh, but for the rest of our participants, thank you so much. Uh, please, I hope you can take the time to complete our post-event survey and give us some data to improve our, um, our event. Uh, it's accessible via the link provided in the chat box and also the QR code on your screens. If you would like to request a certificate of attendance, please fill up the survey and send an email to cassandra.barnes at idinsight.org. Um, please keep in touch with us by connecting on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We hope today's discussion opens a lot of doors and opportunities for increased collaboration. We already saw in the chat some conversations about um, you know, academics and researchers potentially helping local governments in, um, in using the data that they already have, but using and helping analyze and uh, make sense of that data. So we hope this is uh, the beginning of, of partnerships that this platform serves as a way to increase the collaboration of different um, organizations towards a, a richer culture of data use in the Philippines. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a good afternoon. Um, I would like to ask our panelists, our speakers, and our partners to stay on for a quick photo opportunity. Sorry. Okay. Um, I will count to three and um, oh, three, two, one, and then we can take a photo. Three, two, one. One more. Three, two, one. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for all of the people behind the scenes, Ivy, Karen, uh, Mai, Sheila, um, and, and uh, our ID Insight team for yeah, excellent work. Um, we had more than 300 participants. Wow. Um, so that is quite impressive. And thank you so much to... Um, Bernadette, Sarah, Robin, and Ime for taking time to join us. Thank you. Congratulations. And thank you, Ron, for orchestrating also all of this. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, everyone. Salamat, Badet. Thank, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, Ron. Salamat. Bye. Recording.